الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع نفوسنا أبا القاسم محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين لا سيما بقية الله روحي وأرواح العالمين لتراب مقدمه الفداء أما بعد respected scholars, elders, brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته As we've been discussing in the last night the position of Ali ibn Abi Talib in reference to a particular hadith in which we stated by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam that you, O oh Ali, are to me like Aaron was to Moses, except that there is no prophet after me. And we discussed three particular points in which we look at the second Khalifa and how he was envious of Ali ibn Abi Talib in three occasions in which we stated he was envious because Ali ibn Abi Talib married Fatima al-Zahra, Ali ibn Abi Talib bought victory in Khaybar, and the third and the main source of our discussion was that Ali ibn Abi Talib had that particular statement by the Prophet about him. And we discussed on the second level the issue of brotherhood. And brotherhood, we didn't complete it yesterday, so inshallah we'll start off by finalizing the aspect of brotherhood and taking it to the next step which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam does in reference to a particular verse from the Holy Quran known as the verse of Mubahala, in which there's a story behind it. Inshallah, we'll discuss it later on tonight. But going back into the issue and the concept of brotherhood in which the Prophet seeks to give to us and distribute to us, to give us a more in-depth example of the closeness of the relationship between the Prophet of Islam and Ali ibn Abi Talib, we have a narration which states that the Prophet of Islam looks towards Abu Dhar. As you know, Abu Dhar was a person, a companion that always spoke his mind. And the Prophet gave him the statement in which he says, Abu Dhar, there is nothing that the sun sets on more truthful in its speech than Abu Dhar. So the Prophet looks at Abu Dhar and he says, Oh, Abu Dhar, he says, Do you know what is the best type of brotherhood? Remember, again, we're discussing the aspect of brotherhood. He says, the best aspect of brotherhood that we've been taught is the brotherhood between the prophets. Then the brotherhood between the mu'mineen. So the Prophet of Islam looks towards Abu Dhar and he says, yes. He says, do you want me to tell you of a brotherhood more close and better than that which you have mentioned? He says, please, do enlighten me, O Prophet of Islam. He says, the brotherhood between me and Ali ibn Abi Talib. Salli ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. One of the four schools outside the school of thought of Ahl al-Bayt, one of their founders by the name of Ahmed ibn Hanbal, which is reference to the Hanbali school of thought, his son once comes to him. In a story which he asks, Ahmed ibn Hanbali says to him, he says, who is the greatest person or greatest people after the Prophet? Now look at this in particular reference. Now the first question is, you think to yourself, well obviously he's going to answer that way. He says the best people after the Prophet is the first and second Khalifa. Then he looks at him, the son looks at the father, he says, what do you say about Ali ibn Abi Talib? He says, you want me to compare him? He says, yes, what's he in comparison to the first and two? The answer that Ahmed Muhammad gives him is very, very special. That's what I particularly reckon. Because he says, he says, my son, I thought you were tell, talking to me about me, humans, men, not people of high ranks and people that are known to be of the household of the Prophet. That's the difference. He says, it's not me, men. He is the household of the Prophet. And he takes us to the next level. When Ali ibn Abi Talib, the Prophet of Islam, leaves, he gives the trust to Ali ibn Abi Talib as he wants to migrate. He says, return these amana. Make sure you take these particular fawatim from this place to this place. He entrusts him. And he says, I have one last and final task 
for you, O Ali. He says, what is it, O Prophet of Islam? He says, I want you to sleep in my bed. When the kuffar come, they will try to attack you. Do you take this? Do you take this risk that they might kill you? Look at the reply of Ali ibn Abi Talib to show you the position of Ali ibn Abi Talib. How much he wanted to sacrifice for the religion of Islam. He says to the Prophet of Islam, he says, O oh Prophet, as long as you will be okay, can you tell me that you will be okay? Then I am happy to do it without a shadow of doubt. He says, I'll be okay. Ali ibn Abi Talib goes down in prostration and he says, Shukran lillah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the heavens, we have the narration that states that he looks and he says to Jibra'il and Mikail, look at this narration, brothers and sisters. He says to Jibra'il and Mikail, he says, I have made you two brothers. I have made you two brothers. And then he asks the question, who would like to give up his life or the remainder of his life so that his brother can live for a longer lifespan. So Jibra'il and Mikael are looking at each other. No one of them answers to the other saying, I'll give up my life for you. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ihbita ila al -ard. Go towards the earth. There you will find my servant, which without hesitation was happy to give up his life for his brother, Rasulullah Muhammad. Now that's all well and true in the idea and concept of brotherhood. The next level, because we look at brotherhood, the next level up, up is the verse in question, which is in Al-Amran, verse 61. Chapter 3, Al-Amran, verse 61. Now the story is very, very famous. And I bring forth this particular story because the hadith and the people that it represents in all schools of thought is universal. No one will come and say, no, we have this opinion on this particular person. We have that opinion. It's mutawatir. That these were the figures in question. Now the ayah comes down when the Christians of Najran come to a debate with the Prophet of Islam and they would not come towards Islam. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings the verse in which you will have a mubahala, in which you bring, and the verse says in question, Nad'u abna'ala our sons, we will call forth, or we will bring our sons, abna'ana wa abna'akum. We will bring forth our sons, you bring forth your sons. Or we will bring forth our children, you bring forth your children. Then he goes on to say, wa nisa'ana wa nisa'akum. Our woman, plural, look at the, the verse in question, plural, woman, nisa'ana wa nisa'akum. Then he goes on to say, wa anfusana wa anfusakum. Ourselves, bring forth yourself, We'll bring forth ourselves. Remember, this is a mutawatir. Every single school of thought agrees upon the figures that the Prophet brought that day. Every single figure in history, every historical book you will open up, no one will disagree. For his children, plural, he brought forth Hassan and Hussein. Doesn't bring forth any other companion or child or young sibling. The Prophet of Islam is trying to show us. Hussainun minni wa ana min Hussein. So in the 10th of Muharram, people knew who they killed. Our children, your children, bring them forth. Women, plural. Who does he bring? All the women? Does he bring his wives? Does he bring anyone from his companions? Good women in Islam. There were so many great women at the time he could have brought forth. He brings forth one woman that represents the entire nation. Remember, you're representing Islam at this stage. You're bringing Islam into the picture. He takes one woman, which was Fatima to Zahra. That's number two. Now, this is the thing I want to look at. And this is the depth that I want to get to. There's one aspect of brotherhood between the Prophet of Islam and Ali ibn Abi Talib. But this is the next level. The Prophet, what does the verse say? Anfusana wa anfusakum. Ourselves and yourselves. The Prophet of Islam could have came himself. He doesn't. What does he do? He sends Ali ibn Abi Talib as himself. He sends Ali ibn Abi Talib as himself. Go look at the history books. Tell, get me one particular 
historical article that says otherwise, that he brought someone else as himself, or he went as himself. Every historical book records that the Prophet of Islam brought Ali ibn Abi Talib as himself. Surah Tawbah, the ninth chapter in the Quran, was revealed. The narrations say Abu Bakr was given the chapter to go and reveal to Quraysh. And then Jibrail comes down towards the Prophet. Look at the, look at the question which he questions the Prophet. He says, O Prophet of Islam, Allah has told me that either you or yourself have to reveal this verse. We think to it first and foremost, how does it make sense? You or yourself. Obviously, he's going to go himself. But when we look at it in comparison to Ayat al-Mubahala, we begin to realize who he meant when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Either you or yourself has to reveal this ayah. He sent Ali ibn Abi Talib to stop him halfway and then he takes it. The comparison between Musa and Ali happens right here. When Quraysh, the narration states that in Quraysh there was not a family or not a household that Ali ibn Abi Talib didn't bring sorrow to because he has killed one of their relatives. Whether it be distant or close. Because you fought the kuffar in all these wars. Musa, when the comparison happens between Ali ibn Abi Talib and Musa, the comparison is Musa killed one person and he was afraid to go back. Ali ibn Abi Talib says, I knew very well when I went to Quraysh there was not a household unless it was in mourning because of my sword. He says, I went without a fear in my heart. Now it brings us, inshallah, to the main topic for tonight. Brotherhood, self. Look at that comparison. We can now have so much ahadith that go into detail of the position of Ali ibn Abi Talib. And inshallah, we'll discuss them in the upcoming nights. But inshallah, I want to conclude with a particular incident that happened. On the Prophet's first and last hajj. As we know, the Prophet of Islam only went once. So the people look at the importance, one of the, one of the pillars that you have. Imagine, salah, they record it. Siyam, they record it. Zakah, khums, they record it. So when it came to something so grand as Hajj, the Prophet went there once. He went to Amr's one Hajj. So you can imagine the recording. Everything that the Prophet does in detail. He gets to a place or close to a place by the name of Ghadir Khum. Jibrail comes down. He says, all those people that have gone in front of you, tell them to come back. Everyone that's behind you, tell them to come forward and we'll meet in this particular point. Not a problem. He does that, he waits. In the heat of that area, brothers and sisters, the lecture of the Prophet of Islam is narrated to go for as long as three hours, in which they got the saddles and they piled it up until there was a member for the Prophet of Islam. He stood on top and he gave his speech, in which he had people under him repeating verse by verse so everyone may hear it. As they did that, the Prophet of Islam, because three hours speech, one particular aspect we want to look at in the reference of Ali ibn Abi Talib, in the reference of the wilaya, in the reference of the position of Ali ibn Abi Talib, in the eyes of Allah and the choice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We look at a particular aspect in which the Prophet of Islam says, Man kuntu mawla fa'aliyun mawla. That's in question, isn't it? Because the other schools of thought come forth and say, well, yes, Mawla means friend. So you're telling me the Prophet of Islam stopped all these hujjaj, brought everyone back, everyone that's behind him brought him forth in the heat of the sun at that time after Hajj to tell them, well, Ali is my friend. That's it. Everyone knows. Is it that important? But look at the context. Because Mawla has over 20 meanings and sub-meanings in the Arabic language. But obviously the Prophet of Islam knows the Arabic better than anyone else. He says, even to the people that don't understand, I'll put it into context for you. Because we can look at the actual letters and the harakat and the perfection of what the Prophet says. Or we can look at it in an overall context because the Prophet puts it into context. How? The verse before it, if we read it. He says to the people, am I not or do, not, do I not have an authority over you more than yourselves. He says, am I not 
of a higher authority than you have on yourselves. Alas to awla bil mu'mineen min anfusihim, isn't it? Am I not of a greater authority on you than yourselves? What do they reply with? Bala. Yes, you do have a greater authority on us than ourselves. Then the verse comes. Then, whoever I am his mawla, now Ali is his mawla. Sallu ala Muhammad wa Muhammad. And that's, that's the verse in question. When someone comes forth and says, well, the Prophet of Islam says, he brought everyone together. Over 100,000 people brought them together just to say, well, Ali is my friend. This is what you have to reply with. This is, the, this is the importance of what you have to reply with. When the second Khalifa is narrated to have, we've been walking at the end of his Khilafah, one of, the, one of his companions, he narrates this. He says, I saw the second Khalifa walking and he was in a very uneasy state. A very uneasy state of thoughts. Very, very saddened, depressed, troubled. So I asked the second Khalifa, he says, what troubles you? Look at the reply of the second Khalifa, and I want you to take it into comparison with the Prophet of Islam and to show you how much they degrade the Prophet and how much in history he's been degraded. The second Khalifa is noted to have said to his companion, I am so thoughtful and I want to make a perfect decision that who will I leave and entrust to this religion to? I need to choose someone in the right manner and the right perspective to take control of all the Islamic empire, this great religion. I need to put someone in charge which is worthy. Now the question arises, where did the Prophet come into question? Do you not think that the Prophet of Islam would have had that, would have had that thought? Or do you have left it for the people? When we have the calamity of Thursday, go and Google it tonight, the calamity of Thursday. Every historian narrates it. People around the Prophet split into two. After the Prophet of Islam, and countless occasions, Ghadir Khum is just one of them. The Prophet told the people after he comes back to the last war, he says, make sure you go towards the army of Usama. I don't want anyone in here. Leave Ali ibn Abi Talib in charge. So they stayed back. Against the Prophet's will, even though he cursed them. That's the second opinion. On the third level, what happens when he gathers everyone around him on his deathbed? He does it on a Thursday. The calamity of Thursday. He passes away on the Monday. How many days before it? A number of days. He says, give me what we refer to now as a pen and a paper so I may write for you something that if you hold on to, you will never go astray after me. The people knew who it was because he already said it countless times. Hold on to the Quran and my Ahl al-Bayt. The Quran and my Ahl al-Bayt. The Quran and my Ahl al-Bayt. Countless occasions. So the people there and then knew what he was going to write down on that scroll. What did they say? Don't give him the parchment. They have the audacity to say that the Prophet is delirious. I can't say the Arabic terminology for it. Because I want the member. I feel that I'm degrading the Prophet mentioning something that's happened in history. Imagine the person at the time that lived with the Prophet had the audacity to say that word about the Prophet. Go look at our calamity of Thursday. The Prophet, the Prophet of Islam saying, bring me this. He says, no, it's the Prophet's delirious. Where well, the Prophet means Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is instructing. It doesn't mean the Prophet's doing it from his own accord. That's why we have one of the scholars now that's reverted into Tashayu by the name of Sheikh Tijani, if anyone's come across him. He narrates and he says, he says, we used to study in eloquence, the essence of Arabic, the essence of eloquence. We used to study Nahjul Balagh. He says, but the way we were, we were taught, the way we were brought up in my particular faculty of study is that whenever Ali ibn Abi Talib is mentioned, our heart clenches. It's as if we have hatred. It's as if we're taught that, you know what, stay away. He says, this is how we've been brought up. So he said, Nahjil Balagh. He says, my heart. 
He says, but don't we dissociate ourselves with these people that are called Shia, these people that are of these origins? He says, my teacher's words is the thing that made me research Tashayya. Research who Amir al-Mu'mineen is. What did he say? The teacher just replies by saying, Man lil balaghati mithlu Ali. Who is for eloquence except for Ali ibn Abi Talib. He says, I heard this and I want to research. How is it that we may dislike this man? Why is it that we may dislike this man? He says, until I reach the hadith in which it states what? Ali, no one likes you except a mu'min. No one hates you except a hypocrite. He says, I came to this and I, and I started to question myself. What do I know? What don't I know? Ali, not only the, the, his companions bear witness to his greatness. The greatness is that his enemies bear witness to his greatness. When we have the, the, narrate, the poem which we recite, which Baas from Karbala is recited on countless occasions, this is attributed to one of his enemies, one of Ali ibn Talib's enemies. When the poem starts off by saying, Bi Ali Muhammadin, the enemy then says what? وَضَرْبَتَهُ كَبَيْعَتِهِ بِخُمِّنْ مَعَاقِدُهَا مِنَ النَّاسِ الرِّقَابُ فَإِنْ لَمْ تَبْرَأْ مِنْ عَدَاءِ عَلِيٍّ فَمَا لَكَ فِي مَحَبَّتِهِ ثَوَابُ عَلِيُّ الدُّرْ وَالذَّهَبُ الْمُصَفَّى وَبَاقِ النَّاسِ كُلُّهُمُ تُرَابُ هُوَ الْبَكَّاءِ فِي الْمِحْرَابِ لَيْلًا هُوَ الضَّحَاكِ ذَ اشْتَدَّ الضَّرَابُ هو النبأ العظيم وفلك نوح وباب الله وانقطع الخطاب صلوات Enemies bear witness What do we have to learn from his close companions if his enemies bear witness to this And I end on this note inshallah brothers and sisters just to give us a glimpse of the position of Ali ibn Abi Talib and insha'Allah, in the upcoming nights, we want to discuss the essence of Ali, the secret with his, which is kept within Ali ibn Abi Talib, when the Prophet of Islam, and I end on this narration, the Prophet of Islam is narrated to say about Ali ibn Abi Talib, and I'm going to say it in English before I say it in Arabic, and insha'Allah, we we'll raise our hands in dua. But he says about Ali, he says, if I did not fear that people will say about you what they said about Jesus, son of Mary, so the Prophet saying, if I was not afraid that my ummah would take you as a, as a god, well, billah, I would have said something about you that the people will take from the dust of your feet and your ablution, that which will they, they will find blessed. They will find blessings in. But it's enough that I am from you and you are from me and your followers are on pulpits of nur. He says, Ya Ali, lawla. أن أخاف أن تقول فيك طائفة من أمتي ما قالته النصارى في عيسى بن مريم لقلت فيك كلمة لا تمر بها على ملأ إلا وأخذوا من تراب عليك ومن طهورك ما يستشفون به لكن حسبك أنك مني وأنا منك وشيعتك على منابر من نور مبيضة وجوههم حولي في الجنة وهم جيراني We want to discuss what the Prophet of Islam had and what the Prophet of Islam knew about Ali ibn Abi Talib Oh Ali, no one knows you except me and Allah and no one knows Allah except me and you He says to Ali ibn Abi Talib Who is Ali? We'll discuss that in the upcoming nights, insha'Allah. But for now, we want to pray to Allah and thank Allah that He has kept us on this path. And we pray to Allah with a Surah Al Mubarakat Al Fatiha, Tasbiqaha, three of your loudest salawat, Allah Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad.